I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Lynn Layton. We talk about her career and specifically her brand new book, Towards a Social Psychoanalysis, Culture, Character, and Normative Unconscious Processes, available from Rutledge. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Trapart Books, 2019. Now also available on iBook and Kindle. Please visit our publisher's website, www.trapart. Net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l. Your support is greatly appreciated. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. So, hi, I'm delighted to be here. And I'm coming to you not from my home, which is in Boston. Um, uh, an epicenter of the coronavirus, sadly, um, but from Santa Barbara, uh, California. And um, the the reason I'm here is because Boston's an epicenter, but um, secondarily, I, I, uh, I teach um, a course in social psychoanalysis at, a, at an incredible program in Santa Barbara at the Pacifica Graduate Institute. The program is called um, Community in uh, Liberation, Indigenous, and Eco-Psychologies. And it's a PhD program uh, depth, in the depth psychology department. Everyone is left-wing, everyone is feminist. It's just my dream department. Uh, and the students are you know, incredibly wonderful people. Some are therapists, but um, most are working in organizations. They're mostly activists working in organizations with traumatized and underserved populations. Uh, so, so they are also just wonderful. And my course, um, which I'll talk about more maybe a little later, is in social psychoanalysis. And um, so it's just, it's just been a dream to be able to teach what I want to teach in a department that is as dedicated to social change as... Um, as, as it can be. So uh, that's just by way of, of location. Um, you had suggested talking about how I came to psychoanalysis, and that's a very long story because I'm pretty old. <laughs> and it was a, wi- a winding story. Um, I started out in a comparative literature PhD program. I, I do have a PhD in comparative literature. And uh, I think it was in my First semester. I think I probably always had an interest in um, unconscious process, but in the first semester, I think, of my graduate training, I was in a course on um, intellectual history, and the professor, whose name was Eisenberg, was teaching about Freud, and um, you know, at this point, I probably, in terms of like my activism, which has been there from the very beginning, I was mostly involved in feminist. Um, stuff and consciousness raising and activism. Um, and th- at the time, this was in the early 70s, there was a pretty strong anti psychoanalytic bent in feminism um, because of various books. Um, Kate Millett, several, uh, several uh, feminists were very negative about Freud and about psychoanalysis. Um, and I was in some consciousness raising groups at the time. So I, uh, I was in this class and one day he started talking about Freud and he really got into depth on fleece, the Freud and fleece relationship. 
was talking about the connections that were being made between um, problems of the nose and um, <laughs> ENT and and uh, and the the mind um, hysteria. And as the class went on, I, I came in perfectly healthy to that class, <laughs> but I started sneezing. <laughs> about the middle of the class, and by the end of the class, I had a full-blown raging cold. And that made me think, wow, <laughs> there's, there's something about this connection between sexuality and the nose was working on my body. And um, that was, I think, where I would date the beginning of my belief in unconscious process. <laughs> so, uh, so I also was quite fortunate because um, at the time in the early 70s at Washington University where I was studying, uh, there was a journal called Telos, which was the journal that brought critical theory from the continent to, um, to the United States. And I became part of what they were calling the Telos Collective um, and was in a reading group with Paul Picconi, who was the editor. Um, and we read uh, Adorno and Horkheimer and Marcuse, um, interestingly, we did not read Fromm, um, and Fromm will come in, he, he's been a huge influence actually on my work, but by then he had been, well, certainly by then, he had been excommunicated from Frankfurt School lore. Um, so, and we even were, we read uh, Nancy Chodorow's book, which came out in 1979, uh, Reproduction of Mothering. So there was a, a pretty, it, it was a Marxist psychoanalytic connection that that was really what you know inspired the all the work that I then was doing I did my dissertation on um, Fontana and Flaubert um, and the subtitle as you must always have a subtitle was Fontana and Flaubert colon the defeat of subjectivity question mark um, so my work I was always looking at what are the forces of oppression, how do they work themselves through the psyche, and how does the psyche resist, both com comply and, and resist. Um, and always just really curious about how, I think it's Jacqueline Rose probably put this best, how, how do you uh, account for how the outside gets in and the inside gets out without reducing psychic reality to social reality or social reality to psychic reality. So um, so I was going to be a com comparative literature professor, and I, on the side, I was going to become a psychoanalyst. Um, however, <laughs> the realities of academia in the 70s and 80s, and probably persisting into the 90s, was that it was very difficult to get a job in comparative literature. I did get a job in Boston in humanities, um, but it wasn't the kind of job I really wanted to have. And so uh, a few years into that job, I, I decided to retrain and I, I, I retrained as a psychologist. Um, and at that time, although, yeah, it was, it was before psychology was completely bankrupt, although it was fairly bankrupt. It was to pretty much totally individualist, but I happened to end up at Boston University in a program that uh, was quite psychoanalytic. By the 90s, it was quite not psychoanalytic, um, but in the 80s, it was. And um, there was a professor who taught Freud, but he also taught Kohut. And uh, learning about uh, Kohut and narcissism and Kernberg um, and putting that together with, so some of, towards the end of my time in St. Louis and working on Telos, we had a big conference on the culture of narcissism. And Christopher Lash was there and, um, uh, Joel Covell. So I, I was quite interested in narcissism and had not yet come to understand it as a clinician would understand it. Uh, but um, uh, the, the professor, the, the professor who was the most psychoanalytic at my at Boston University was very became very interested in Kohut, and we took I took a course on that and attended a a really interesting con literature conference called The World as Mirror. Um, with a friend of mine who was also teaching at Boston University, and we ended up putting together a volume on uh, called Narcissism and the Text, which was studies, we subtitled Studies in Literature and the Psychology of the Self. So it, it was most, much of it was Kohut um, applied to literature, like Wordsworth, I did mine on Flaubert, um, 
and uh, but um, it was uh, also um, other other like object relations was part of the book too. It wasn't just uh, self psychology. I later became actually quite critical of um, aspects of self psychology, particularly from a, a gender perspective. So that that's the other side of the other side of my story is that I continue to teach in academia, and I was so lucky to be teaching in women's what was called women's studies at the time at Harvard University. So I was teaching courses in um, gender and then later in gender race class, you know, once we started thinking more intersectionally. Um, and I started doing a lot of, re I, I was always reading in feminist theory, but then queer theory started to emerge and critical race theory. Um, and particularly, I would say post-structuralist work um, by that time, I was a clinician. I was understanding more about narcissistic injury and the defenses against it from a clinical perspective. And I started to feel like clinicians have no concept of the social world, very little, never going much beyond family in terms of history. Um, but academics, sometimes I wonder, have they ever talked to a person? because the, much of the stuff that I was reading was like, okay, for example, celebrations of fragmentation. That, that, was, a big, that was a big theme in feminist theory of the, um, of the 80s. Uh, you know, decentering the self. Yes, there, there's a way that I understand that that's uh, um, very important and useful, but as I say, some of these celebrations of fragmentation seem to me to have no concept that most of the time, fragmentation is a result of traumatic experience, um, and it ain't fun. So, um, so I ended up uh, writing. A, uh, well, I was, I was doing writing on gender and psychoanalysis, and um, I put together a lot of my essays in a book in 1998 called. I was also very influenced by Madonna because I was teaching popular culture. <laughs> Uh, also, I always taught popular culture, which is, was part of, this is a tangent, but part of my departure from the Adorno-Horkheimer crowd was Adorno's scathing critique of popular culture, which was formative in my own experience and my own coming to question, um, question my so-called role as a woman. Uh, so so I, I was teaching these, these um, courses and uh, writing about Madonna. I actually ended up doing being in a documentary on Madonna that was done by these British documentarians who were so intrigued by the fact that Madonna was being taught in a Harvard class that they recreated a mock class for their documentary. Um, and all of these, the essays that I put together, um, so the, the book was called, this is the Madonna Connection, Who's That Girl, Who's That Boy? Clinical Practice Meets Postmodern Gender Theory. And what I was trying to do was create a dialogue between um, post-structuralist gender and sexuality theory and what I was, was seeing in the clinic. Um, in, you know, I, if I were to psychoanalyze myself, I would say that this, this is a, also a part of my history that I'm always trying to get two forces, you could call it mommy and daddy, to talk to each other. So I was trying to get academics to talk to clinicians and clinicians to talk to academics. Not easy in a, um, particularly in a, in a kind of a publishing market where if your book's psychoanalytic, it just goes to psychoanalysts. But, but I, I do think there were some, I did have some readership in, in academia. And, um, and then I, uh, so that book, um, Theoretically, I was trying to look at always having been interested in resistance, not the psychoanalytic form of resistance, but the political form of resistance. Um, I was always interested in both what thwarts development, growth, change, and what, uh, res what resists the forces of oppression that we internalize. Um, and, and I would say also, and I think, you know, there have been some critiques of this when, when I, the, the large, um, largely in my book, I am thinking of gender development as traumatic experience. Uh, so all of my work in all of my work, trauma, I think some people would say is trauma with a small T. 
Um, it's not poverty, it's not famine, it's not war. It's the everyday, um, as Fromm would call it, pathologies of normalcy that create trauma for, for people in telling them how they, what a proper subject is, what a proper female is, what a proper male is. And in the course of, of working on the, the book, um, I had come to the idea that both fe femininity and masculinity were, uh, in their ideal versions in, in my culture, were narcissistic structures. Um, because they required that we split off and project uh, various parts of what it means to be human to become loved and cared for subjects. And I guess that's where Fromm started to, become, to come in because of his theories around uh, why, we, why we deform ourselves, why, how the social, what he calls the social unconscious develops, um, having to do with the longing and needs for love and approval. Um, and uh, I, I, I believe that. I believe that. <laughs> so, um, so I was looking at those those uh, external societal forces and structures that create traumatic experience and create what I was considering again narcissistic versions of femininity, narcissistic versions of masculinity. You know, later complicating that again through intersectionality and looking at um, white white femininity. Um, uh, as it develops in opposition to uh, and superiority to other versions in the culture um, and in inferiority to masculinity, white masculinity. Uh, but then I also, in, in the Who's That Girl book, was really looking at um, those forces of resistance to, uh, to the forces of domination. After writing the book, so now we're in, uh, you know, we're in the 90s, and there's a lot of feminist psychoanalytic writing beginning, particularly, I would say, um, there was an issue, well, I, I had started to become attracted to relational psychoanalytic theory. I was, became, had become critical of Kohut uh, and moved into, um, it, it just spoke to me. You know, I, I, I've actually, I've written also about why relational theory, why now? Um, uh, but I, you know, you you you're can, you are attracted to what feels true to you, and um, Stephen Mitchell's work on uh, traumatic experience, all experience arising from our experiences in um, relational matrices, family, culture, schools, they connected for me with even with things you know like Althusser's. Uh, writing on ideology. Um, I, I had listened to an earlier one of your podcasts with Ian Parker, and um, I, when he was talking about his attraction to Lacan and, and started talking about where it was, ego shall be, and how he under, uh, understands that, he, he talked, uh, he said something like, uh, talk, talked about finding ourselves in the ensemble of human relations and what can't be spoken there. And Rather than leading me to Lacan, that led me to um, United States version of relational uh, conflict analytic theory. And some of the feminist work in that tradition, like Jessica Benjamin, Muriel Dimon, Virginia Goldner, uh, Adrian Harris. Um, and I, I became sort of part, part of that group. I worked on a journal with them called Gender and Psychoanalysis, which then became Studies in Gender and Psychoanalysis. Um, but one of the things about relational theory that was, well, there were a couple of things that were really attracting me. One was the idea of the co-construction, uh, anal analyses being co-constructed. And um, in particular, that the analyst has no more purchase on, on the truth of what he or she is saying um, than anyone. And that was, that was an idea of Edgar Levinson's. Like, I, I don't know if what the patient is saying about me is less true than what I think about myself. So um, the idea of starting to think about, um, well, at one of the central concepts is, a, is enactment in this tradition, how things that traumatic experience that has not been formulated gets enacted um, in the work. And, uh, and I started then thinking, after reading pieces like um, Neil Altman's work on black and white thinking, um, about his work with an African-American man and how his own Jew, Jew, white Jewishness 
uh, came into unconsciously and consciously came into conflict um, in that treatment. Uh, Melanie Suchet, a couple, several people were starting to write about these kinds of enactments. And so my work then started to move more into understand, thinking theoretically about what was going on in these papers and um, thinking about normative countertransferences and transferences. And I, I came up with the concept, which is sort of what I've been working on for the last many years now, of um, normative unconscious processes. In other words, what happens unconsciously as a result of these demands to be what the culture wants or needs us to, to be. Um, the processes of splitting and projective identification and how these play out in relationship, that's what was really um, significant to me in, 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 in doing my own analytic, psychoanalytic work. By the, by the uh, n late 90s, I started analytic training. So, um, and that was after already being a clinician for about 14 years. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that, that kind of, um, that was the, the main work that I was doing in, in the 2000s was really focusing on these, how these normative unconscious processes play out in racial, class, gender, sexuality, um, interactions between patient and therapist, and then sometimes a little more broadly in the culture. At some point, I started to be interested in, um, I don't know how I, you know, like, I didn't, I think I, when I first started thinking about this, I didn't even have the concept of neoliberalism. Um, but, and I should say, I mean, I, I don't think any of my work would be what it is without the fact that I continue to read academic work. I mean, I, clinical papers are, many of them are important and there is a, a kind of a left flank in the relational analytic school, in the Kleinian school, um, that certainly informs my work, but there's so little about culture and the culture, you know, cultural forces at large um, that enter psychoanalytic writing. Um, you know, even worse, there's like such such a uh, tab, not taboo, prescription against it. Like, you know, I, in a in a not that long ago. Um, I was asked to do a commentary on a paper by um, Robert Michaels and Otto Kernberg that was about what psychoanalysis needs to be. And basically they were arguing that it needs to connect with the university more and it needs to have higher, the institutes need to have higher standards and more competencies. Um, and, uh, you know, I actually, so this, this was my next topic was neoliberalism. <laughs> and I saw what they were saying as a very neoliberal approach. They clearly had no idea what was going on in psychology departments, which had, at that point had no interest in psychoanalysis. Um, and I wrote a, my commentary was a critique and they wrote back, this woman is importing politics into psychoanalysis and that's dangerous. So that's kind of what I feel like I've been up against. <laughs> and perhaps going back to why I'm so grateful to being in the Pacifica program that I'm teaching in, in right now. I, you know, I, have, I do have a, a group of wonderful colleagues. I am um, uh, a past president of section nine of division 39, which is psychoanalysis for social responsibility. And everybody in that section is you know, what, what keeps me going. I just dedicated my most recent book to section nine. Um, anyway, I, I, getting back to what I was saying, I, I started writing about neoliberalism, the psych, psychological effects of neoliberalism, um, which we are seeing play out so strongly during this pandemic from the free market, in the United States anyway, um, from the, the free market uh, ridiculousness of competing for ventilators on the open market um, to, you know, to these free choice people who are out screaming about opening up the economy and with their, egg, with their assault weapons. Um, so a lot of my writing was, has been about neoliberalism and that in my, my most recent book, which just came out in March, a wonderful time to have a book come out <laughs> in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> Um, is a collection of my writing uh, from 2000 to 2019, and it's called uh, Toward a Social Psychoanalysis, Culture, Character, and Normative Unconscious Processes. And I'm trying to 
weave together uh, the work. There's a, a section three of the book is all papers on neoliberalism. Section two is papers that are focused on these kinds of racial genders, sexuality kinds of enactments that I was talking about earlier. And section one are some of my theoretical papers. Um, you know, for example, one is called "What What Divides the Subjects." Just papers on. They're, they weren't written to uh, to say this is what social psychoanalysis is because I would never do do that. But they would would give you the sense of what my version is. As I said, heavily indebted to From. Um, the what divides the subject it was a critique of um, some. Uh, actually, it was. Well, it wasn't a, really a critique of Lacanian writing. Um, it took up a, a, a debate between Lynn Siegel and Juliet Mitchell, uh, and um, Lynn Siegel taking a more relational kind of perspective, and um, Juliet Mitchell taking a more Lacanian, Kleinian perspective on what the unconscious is. What the unconscious is. <laughs> I don't talk ever about what the unconscious is or what the contents of the unconscious are. I talk about un unconscious processes as they are generally enacted in relationship. Um, and uh, so in, in that paper I'm talking about, um, the question was what divides the subject? Are we defending against some existential split from our origin from meaning to being, as many Lacanians will write about, or are we defending against these um, ideological uh, uh, elements in the culture that are telling, you know, from our parents, from our teachers, how we need to be? Um, so obviously I come down on, on that, that second, second part. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's pretty much my uh, psychoanalytic story. I, I also am more and more and more, partly because of where the United States has been, uh, more, more and more activist. Um, I am desperate to be uh, help do whatever I can to get rid of our current regime um, from top to bottom, just getting rid of the, the Republicans and their ideology. And their, it's not even their ideology because I don't even know if, I mean, they, they, they purport to be neoliberals. Democrats have been very neoliberal themselves, which is part of the problem. Um, but really it feels more like at this point, a, a crony capitalism that has no real moral, no ideology, no moral base except greed and power. And, uh, and I guess that's another thing that I've been writing about more recently. Um, Taking off from Freud's, so my understanding via a wonderful book by Alan Bass um, called Difference and Disavowal, um, I think that's what it's called, uh, I, I didn't agree with his outcome, which is that what divides the self is the demand to differentiate, does, does not seem to me to be our major problem, but um, I do agree with his assertion that Freud was moving by the end of his career to replacing uh, repression with disavowal as a primary defense. And um, that is what I see as rampant in uh, and uh, culture wrecking, um, at least in the United States. And it leads, as Bion talked about, to a, uh, a culture of lying. If you disavow, um, I think in the United States, the disavowal is of our interconnectedness, of our vulnerability, of dependency, all of that gets split off and projected downward on um, other popu uh, minority populations. Um, and uh, when you do that, you know, you are, when you're, you, you have to, you commit yourself to a culture of lying um, because I, I, I love the, the distinction Beyond makes between um, feeling pain and suffering pain. Um, and uh, I think this is a culture that refuses to actually suffer, suffer pain, tolerate frustration. You can see it everywhere right now. Um, and, and then there is no, as he puts it, learning from experience. And I, I really feel like that's the dilemma that we're caught in right now. I was just saying this morning to my husband, I don't see how we're ever going to get out of where we are right now in the United States. I'm watching other countries getting out of it. But 
this culture is so committed to magical thinking and lying that um, it just feels like it's 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 going to be a, a it is a disaster and it's going to continue to be a disaster. So a lot of my activism right now is in election work and combating those that lying version of relation to reality. And I'm also uh, very involved in a reparations um, campaign, a grassroots reparations campaign that I've been working on for a couple of years. And um, I could talk about that, but I think I've talked <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> it's amazing. I love your story. And that's why I always try to ask everyone like how they got into psychoanalysis because everyone's past is so different and none is very straightforward, you know? It's like I've never met someone that was just like, oh, I decided I was going to be a psychoanalyst and I went and did psychology and then did landlord training in this like very straight line. Like I'm sure someone has done that, but most people have had this kind of winding road. Or even when you get into the field, like you said, there's all sorts of different avenues you can go within the different theor theoretical orientations. And sometimes yeah. you start out with one and then kind of move to another or become more eclectic or, you know, leave some sort of uh, ideas behind. You know, it's just such an kind of evolutionary uh, trajectory everybody's on. Everyone's evolving all the time, changing. Exactly, yes. And so much about, you know, I, I, I know that there's so much about my history and my past that have pushed me in that direction versus that direction. And, you know, that's, that's psychoanalytic, right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, so do we, what should we talk about? Should we talk about social psych, psychoanalysis? So I found out about your work from Laura Sheehy, and I met her last year here in Stockholm at a conference that we were both at together. And she's just like, speaking of like finding new pathways in psychoanalysis, she like meeting her just opened up this entire part of the field that I wasn't even, I didn't even know was going on, which makes me so happy because it's more, more resonant with what I think and was hoping to do, but I just kind of hadn't found y'all yet. You know, oh, so I love well. like everyone doing this kind of decolonial work and, you know, looking at all the different cultural issues and political issues, because in my training, like you said, it, there was there was pretty much a taboo on talking about politics. It was like un we were basically told it's unethical to talk about like culture and politics in a psychoanalytic way and like to project that out there that we were not supposed to do that. Yes, and uh, you know, whenever whenever I write about that taboo, I um, I try to be quick to point out and in as clear a fashion as possible that the choice to exile politics and the social world is a politics. It is not neutral. <laughs> the fantasy. I mean, I think that's the big gaslight. Right, that the that those who are disdainful of of uh, are bringing in the social world and the political world and um, and bringing up things to our patients that we're not supposed to bring up or notice. Um, like you know, there's some recent work, uh, some I did, some others on on whiteness um, within a white white dyad. Dy dyad. Uh, Nancy Hollander has a wonderful paper on that. Um, and people are starting to write about that because in the early days, people were just writing about cross-racial dyads. So it was usually a white person talking about his or her work with um, a person of color. Uh, but that kind of left whiteness a little bit to the, to the side, like when you're working with a white patient, race doesn't matter. So I think it's been a really great development that people are, uh, I've just re recently read a paper for a journal, I don't know who wrote it, it was, I, I reviewed it, um, that was also about work in, in a white, white dyad, and yeah, so so that's what you're leaving out, you know, when you when you say uh, that, that, that this stuff isn't relevant, or uh, there are people, I've heard people change gender, change a gender to maintain confidentiality, and, and that, that's a difficult issue, I think, maintaining confidentiality, when you do believe that the social world matters because the gender matters, the age matters, you know, this in terms of historical influences. Um, but when you change the gender you know, of, your, of the patient to disguise the patient, and you're a white male and you're changing a female gender to a male gender, yeah, I've read, I've read too many papers, you know, there's, there's one that um, a few of us were asked to comment on some years ago by a very famous analyst of the 50s, 60s, and 70s named Lawrence Kuby. 
and he was working he he was working with a female patient and male patient and his presumptions that he you know that entered his interpretations with these patients were so saturated with the gender norms of his time and the paper was finally published in 74 but he'd been working on it for like 20 years so he's he's writing it kind of at the same time that second wave feminists are challenging these gender norms, but but someone you know of his age and his in that profession was just like wreaking havoc on these patients with these uh, you know men, men can't be men can't be passive um, uh, women if they're his paper was called the drive to the drive to be both sexes. And what both sexes ended up meaning for a woman was wanting children and wanting a career. Enough said, right? <sighs> <laughs> so yeah, I actually so. had a supervisor in my psychoanalytic training. This is like 2010 or 2011. I think it was probably 2011 when this happened. Um, asked me like if my analysis if she was wearing makeup or if she had her nails done or not and I was like I don't know if she had her nails done or not like <laughs> why would I look at that and he was like judging her level of like distress and pathology based on like if she was done up and had her nails done and I was oh, like I'm yeah. sorry like what and decade am I in <laughs> exactly and how many cases Used to, I don't know if they still do, but it used to start with an attractive female in her 40s. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, the, these normative um, unconscious issues permeate. They permeate all, you know, all of our treatments. I, I think one of the things I've been trying to say, um, I, I'll tell you an anecdote that I, I've told many times. Like I, I gave a paper <laughs> in England uh, probably many people in the audience were Kleinian, and, and I very much draw on Kleinian defense mechanisms, but I don't kind of buy into the whole uh, the whole theory. Um, so I'm giving this paper that has many instances of what I was calling normative unconscious processes, and a man in the audience raises his hand, and clearly a Kleinian person <laughs> says, you make a lot of mistakes, don't you? <laughs> it's like so taken aback because uh, I don't consider these mistakes. I use my own work. Okay, so I start in the field as, a, as an academic who used to do textual, imminent textual critique. I started my career by looking at other people's papers who weren't dead. Lawrence Kuby was dead by the time I worked on his, but some of them were not dead and was noticing these extre extreme sexists um, heterosexist enactments people didn't like that very much you know people who had like put themselves out there and written an extended clinical vignette for some other purpose were not very happy with my taking their case apart um, and looking at the the these enact these enactments uh, so I then decided I should really just use my own work and um, focus on the things that I didn't catch maybe didn't catch till two years later, maybe caught in three more sessions, you know, and was able to talk about. Uh, and that, that was this guy's response <laughs> that I make a lot of mistakes. Um, I, I think that my work has found enough re resonance uh, with clinicians to make me feel like most people are aware that we do these, we do these kinds of unconscious enactments. Um, because of how we've been socially shaped. So I, I, I do hope that it's been a contribution to the field to be able to look more closely at these. And as I said, I, I'm certainly not the only person. There are a lot of people at this point, um, starting I'd say in 2000, who were, were writing about these kinds of, of enactments. And um, you know, for, I, I just provided this umbrella term of normative unconscious processes because first, actually first I, I was talking about a heterosexist unconscious uh, and presented a case uh, with, with that in mind. But as I, yeah, I think mostly through being influenced by critical race theory, intersectionality theory, um, I, uh, I started to think that we need a, a bigger term to comprehend these various kinds of uh, unconscious enactments. 
So, and I, I'm delighted that you have been open, have been uh, connected to uh, these other traditions through Lara, who is a dear, dear, dear friend of mine. Yes, and doing, yes, um, yes, doing yes, amazing yes. things for our field. I'm just so excited by what, you know, unfortunately we couldn't have the program that she created this year because of the pandemic, but um, we will have it next year. And, you know, the, the contribute, when I went through the, the program, the papers were just, they're so exciting. Um, uh, I was going to present on, uh, well, I was going to have a meet the author session for the book, but whatever. Um, but, uh, uh, I, I'm a group of people who are working on these reparations on this reparations project where, um, we had prepared a, uh, like a discussion among six of us, um, uh, two, three African Americans and three, um, differently located white people in terms of age, uh, and religion and other things. Um, our panel was called disrupting whiteness in the pursuit of reparations. And we were hoping to have a conversation that could very well have, um, you know, ended in some kind of enactments. They often do. Um, I just heard a, a webinar with Robin D'Angelo talking to um, Remza Menachem, an African American therapist, and she's the person who wrote the book on white fragility. And after it's a two-hour webinar, and almost at the end, she makes a racist comment and gets called on it and, you know, doesn't respond very well. And here's a woman who's, you know, been writing about this for many, many years, but she was able to return to it, work it through, and um, they worked it through. So, uh, yeah, so I, I, that could very well have happened in our panel. We were structuring it very loosely, but anyway, um, I, I look forward to that happening next March. Yeah, me too. I was supposed to be I have a book on violence and psychoanalysis and I was supposed to do a meet the I was the editor at one of one of the two editors of the book where we were gonna do a presentation of that book. Oh really? Yeah. So you you were you were going to come yeah. to the division? Oh wonderful. Oh well I'll very much look forward to meeting you then next year. Yes. It will be like it will be pow even more powerful, I think, because it will be like on the other side of all of this, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, I would also encourage, um, you know, I don't know what your what your uh, journal circles are, but uh, I was also the editor for like 15 years of the journal Psychoanalysis, Culture, and Society. And um, any work that you're doing on psychoanalysis and culture would be very welcome in that journal. So. Yeah, that's about... the one Michael Laughlin's doing yes. now, right? Because he was at exactly. the same conference here last uh, year. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah, was a good big... crew that I that I connected with. <laughs> I think so. I'm so delighted. Yeah. Wonderful. What are you working on now? Well, you know, as I said, out for months. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on delicately and not self-centeredly trying to promote it in the court in the midst of a pandemic. Um, well, so people need things you know, to read. <laughs> Everyone's stuck at no, home. That is true. You know, I, I didn't say anything about it for a month, and then the first time I think I sent it to somebody, the brochure. Somebody said, "Oh, it's so refreshing to get something that's not about the pandemic." <laughs> Unfortunately, if she starts reading it, she may find that it does bear on the pandemic. But um, anyway, so I'll be doing some uh, Zoom conference, you know, presentations at various institutes. Uh, but mostly, I've got to be honest with you, I just feel like the election work, there is not an issue. So I have this debate with some of my friends sometimes. This is not, this is not really necessarily to psychoanalysis, but maybe it does. Um, everything does, I guess. Uh, you know, people who are working on local grassroots issues where I really think most of the innovative progressive work gets done, um, climate resistance, climate change. But there isn't an issue that I can think of that I care about that will not have a better chance of uh, becoming, you know, national policy, um, statewide policy, uh, if we don't get rid of the current regime. Um, who was I listening to the other day? Oh, I it was Angela Davis, I love this. She did a webinar 
and she never named Trump. She said, the current occupant of the White House, <laughs> whenever she needed to refer <laughs> to what was going on. Um, and it, and as, it's not just him. It is a culture of lying and corruption. And uh, up and down the ballot, I feel like we've got to get people out. So I'm doing that, phone banking, which I hate, text banking, which I like a lot better. <laughs> um, and uh, I also, you know, I'm continuing to work on the reparations project. It's a, it's a really interesting, actually, I, I'm the person who um, heads up this project was a Pacifica faculty member teaching restorative justice. His name is David Ragland. He's African-American. And um, the conceptualization of, the, of this project was uh, to reach out to faith organizations and um, healing organizations. So I work with Section 9 on this with some folks uh, to um, get people to start knowing our true history truth telling is step one and again, yeah that's where the psychoanalysis comes in <laughs> truth telling stop the lying stop the denying stop the disavowal about the history of the united states um and uh co have conversations about reparations the need for reparations um and uh, and then what I what this project specifically focuses on is making connections with um, black led grassroots organ white organizations making connections with black led grassroots organizations that will we call them reparative relationships where that the black led organization will tell the white organization what they need as reparation so. Um, so it's, you know, it hasn't been an easy project to, as they say, operationalize, but, um, you know, it, it, I, I feel like there's some, some groups, there's a, there's a lot of church groups right now and Jewish groups that have racial justice and economic justice committees. Um, so I'm hopeful, sort of, that, you know, I've broken into or connected with is a better word. <laughs> Uh, with some of those. Um, yeah, I heard a wonderful thing the other day listening to a webinar uh, with this group called the Center for Economic Democracy. And um, one of the young activists, mostly they were people of color, was talked in various modes of activity, was talking about this being a zero gravity moment, which really appealed to me. He was describing like everything being just like totally up in the air as if there's no gravity. And how it, how is it going to land? Is it going to land in more a, a more authoritarian culture, which is quite possible? Somebody was uh, talking, maybe it was Robin D'Angelo, about um, disaster white supremacy, like disaster capitalism closely connected mm -hmm. or can it land in a place where we actually contest neoliberal principles recognize our vulnerability create a culture of care in opposition to a culture of profit seeking um recognize our interdependency you know i that's the hope and that's what i would like to be doing in a, more more than writing at the moment that's really what i what I want to be doing. Yeah, and I think it's such an important time to be active, right? Like right now, like we all need to be as active about this as possible. So exactly what you're talking about, so we can make sure we turn it towards a culture of care and all like do our part rather than, you know, being stressed or in our own bubbles and then allowing these kind of large cor corporate and political forces to kind of decide what it's going to look like for us, which is probably going to be worse <laughs> than it already has been. So Absolutely. let's not go that way. It's absolutely. There, there is a one of my patients, and this became the title of one of the papers in in the book. Um, a, you know, she was like probably, how old was she? Maybe in her 30s when I was seeing her in the early 2000s, and she um, she told me that the message that she had gotten when she was growing up was Yale or jail from her. Um, middle class, upper middle class white professional parents. And at the time, I, you know, I thought, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> but as I started like, the, uh, you know, learning more about neoliberalism um, and realizing that that, that, was, that is what this culture has been about, uh, I, I actually retitled it Yale, Fail or Jail. 
um, to, to try to think about what's happened to the white working class, what's happened to the African-American white and middle class, and what's happened to the white, white middle class for whom you either go to Yale or you're a loser. So uh, it's, it's just been tragic. And uh, yeah, I, I like that zero gravity image because it gives me hope that we can land in a different place. Yeah, exactly. Because like you said, the, the current regime is a huge issue, but there's been so many systemic issues in place that allowed this to happen, allowed this to come to power. So there needs to be a lot of work done on like multiple, multiple levels. Uh, and that is so true. I, you know, I, I was very critical of the book. There was this book that came out. I can't even remember when it came out. What's the matter with Kansas? That was um, Thomas Frank's book. I think he kind of came out of a um, Frankfurt schoolish tradition. He might have worked, been a student of Christopher Lash's. I'm not sure, but anyway, if he was trying to talk about, as many people do, why people, you know, it's a psychoanalytic thought actually. Why do people vote against their own interests? And um, you know, he was describing the kind of the fervor around a cultural issue, that cultural, you know, the fervor around anti-abortion and. Um, that that these folks end up that he was talking about end up voting for mostly he's talking about the white working class at the time that he wrote it I think I think it was in it was either in the 90s or the early 2000s the Democratic Party was the same as the you know they, they were as neoliberal as the Republican Party and really the the only thing that was left up for discussion was cultural issues Economic issues were off the table. There was like a consensus that globalization and free market was, you know, the way to go. So, um, so I, I very much disagreed with that work and felt like he was, you know, it was in that in that tradition of people are stupid, which I really try to resist with all my heart. But sometimes lately, it's been really difficult. <laughs> So, yeah, <laughs> that, that would be a bit. It's silly. part of that same normalization process, though. It's been yeah. like they've ingrained to to not think for themselves and in their own best interests a lot. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Someone was I was just reading somebody's op ed. I think it was Thomas Friedman that talked about an immunity to learning and immune. We have to build. <laughs> we have to build this new immunity. <laughs> than the ones we currently are are showing yeah or at least like i'm from florida originally and like you know in the public schools in miami it's like you know it's not cool to learn or be smart or you know think about literature you know it's like very much ingrained that that is not a cool way to be um, yes and i think so that's my... the, the way it is a lot of places yes my family is in florida and we have been having some very interesting conversations. My nephew works at a upper class country club that's been open since the beginning and considered an essential business. Um, Is it in, in Palm Jackson Beach? <laughs> Jackson, uh, Jacksonville, okay. where the beaches are open and the rest of my family is in, uh, is in Gainesville. Um, but uh, Yes, I've really been working hard, as I say, to resist <laughs> to resist those thoughts of. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, so the the one of the things I teach in this social psychoanalysis course um, is Freud's paper on groups. Um, so I so I'll just like briefly say what the structure the structure of the course. The first day, the students don't know anything about psychoanalysis, so um, and it, it's like a totally new language for them. And the way the, the courses, um, our courses are structured, students come from all over the country, well, they used to anyway, and they come for uh, three days a month for, in a semester. So one course is all day Monday, one will be all day Tuesday, mine's all day Wednesday. So the first day I teach basic concepts, transference, counter-transference, resistance, I, a lot of Freud papers, um, forensi, confusion of tongues, <clears throat> and um, and then try to have at least one or two papers that apply that that show how psychoanalysts are applying um, these basic concepts to social critique. The second day, I do group group traditions, which are completely 
like politics, completely banned from psychoanalytic curricula, as far as I can tell. We have such an extraordinary group psychoanalytic tradition, the Tavistock tradition, um, the uh, social defenses tradition of Menzies' life, many of them drawing on Beyond and Klein, um, Freud's large Freud's uh, paper, Vamik Volkan. Um, so I, I teach that because my students are working with groups. They're not, you know, they're working in organizations. And, um, and then uh, the third day I do like themes. Um, but anyway, I was talking, was introduced this because Freud's paper on groups um, so much focuses on the leader and uh, how important the leader is to holding what binds the group. So for him, you know, really his, his insight is that it's love that binds the group to the leader and binds the group to each other. Um, and what a disaster it is when trust, when you can't, there's no trust in the leader. I, I feel like that's kind of what we're, what we're experiencing here in the places where there's decent leadership, like in New York with Cuomo. Um, I, I, I bet people are much more, um, <laughs> much less crazed than, uh, than people who are, you know, being told this and then being told the opposite. And it, it, it's just like, it's so, Frighten it's so frightening. <laughs> yeah, and where so, what to do is up for debate rather than be like the leaders deciding with the scientists right. what the best thing to do is and then informing everyone rather than having these like public arguments it's, all the time. <laughs> it's exactly. not helpful. Or even worse, the um you know, Trump says one thing and then he says the opposite. You know, he, yeah, he and then says tweets for everyone Here's to, the guidelines shoot up bleach the guidelines. or whatever. Yeah, he says, here are the guidelines for opening. And then he says, liberate, Minnesota. you know, he tweets, liberate Michigan, liberate Virginia. So, yeah, it, it, it's horrifying. Clearly, all, all he and his cronies care about is his, his re-election. Um, that's the crony part and uh, the corruption group part and, um, and the economy, what, his fantasy of what the economy is. So, yeah. What do you so, think about the fact that the elections were hacked and what are we going to do about that part? Yes, yeah, so that is a, another issue that I actually also work on too because I, in the 2018 election, um, I was working for a candidate in Georgia whose sister happens to live on my street, which is how I got connected to her. So she, she was running for Congress in a, um, a district right outside of Atlanta uh, against a Republican incumbent. Um, and the voter suppression issues there were huge. Um, she only lost by 430 votes. And of course, that whole, the whole state, Brian Kemp, governor, was running his own election. As he was secretary of state. He was running the election. They purged tons of people. Um, yeah, no, I'm terrified of it. To just watching what happened in Wisconsin uh, a month or so ago where, you know, they reduced the number of polling places from like 180 to five. Um, in a predominantly, I believe, a predominantly minority district. Um, they, they are evil, honestly. The Republicans, I feel like, are evil and are just, they will do anything to win, and they know that if everyone votes, they will not win. They are actually saying that. They're used to, they used to lie and just say, oh, you know, it's voter fraud. Now they actually say, a Republican will never win if everybody votes. So I'm very nervous about that, and um, I am also, I, I work with a group that's called Swing Left, uh, and I work with several groups, but anyway, um, voter suppression issues and uh, election integrity is a very big part of, of what, what we're working on. That's so great. So making sure that some of this phone banking is making sure people get their ballot, their ballot by mail, and send it in. Yeah, because so. my, my first election uh, that I voted in was Gore, Gore and Bush, uh, Bush. and, so, yeah. and I was, I'm from Florida, so it was like, you know, I, we were like, what's happening now? And like, they were doing recounts in the state, and then like, later on, they found like, literally like a truck of ballots, like, dumped in the Everglades. I mean, it was yeah. like, 
So like exactly. before the computer interference, they were just dumping ballots, <laughs> like, like paper ballots. So it's been like this my entire adult life at least. I know. Wasn't there that butterfly ballot issue in Florida? Yeah, yeah. But then, uh, nobody knew who they were really voting for. Yep. Oh, yeah. And it, it just it, happened to be that Jeb Bush was the governor of our state at the time, coincidentally <laughs> enough. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, it's so hard. I, this is something I think about a lot. Like, I, I thought I was really cynical about American politics. But, but what I'm realizing as things get worse and worse is that I actually, it's not true. I, I really did have hope. I, I am invested in some way. And because I can, can continue to be horrified. You know, if I was really just fully cynical, I, it wouldn't horrify me. But every every day I feel like this sense of outrage that um, makes me think I was I'm more hopeful than I thought I was about what can be here. Yeah, yeah. it's the kind of thing. I mean, of course, these past several years have been horrifying. Like we seem to have no bottom to the lows. It's just like, how does this get worse? You know. Right. But um, right. but I always find it really sweet and hopeful and endearing that like the American people are always like trying to find another way and like still fighting and like everybody seems to be like okay well now like even right now where we're like okay well now everything's up in the air so now we have a chance to put it back right. together yeah. you know? it's like we exactly. keep doing that in spite of everything so I think that's and really I, that's really important and I think in truth you know I remember having this argument with a couple of my British colleagues um, in an, another association that's really wonderful, the Association for Psychoanalysis, Culture, and Society, that's it's connected. It's the sister organization to the journal Psychoanalysis, Culture, and Society, and um, we have a lot of uh, British members, or at least we did before people, you know, stopped wanting to fly because of climate issues. Um, but I remember debating with them when they would talk about America. Really, they were talking about like half. Of America, it's kind of like my concept of normative unconscious processes that there's a that we internalize something hegemonic, but that there's always counter hegemonic forces fighting it. Well, that there's there's that's kind of what goes on in the United States. You know, people voted for not that Obama was very left at all, and was even less left than uh, I thought he might be, um, but people voted for him twice. So I think there is a really strong, I think that um, Bernie Sanders really uh, helped push the Democratic Party to the left. And I do get the sense, at least from what they say, that they get this neoliberal thing isn't working for people. And I hope it, I hope they're just not mouthing their understanding of essential workers, but um, we'll have to see, you know? Yeah. We will see. We will see. <laughs> Was there anything else you wanted to be sure to mention before we stop? Maybe, um, maybe the only other thing that this is coming to my mind as we were just talking was that um, I, I don't even know how important this is, but like the guy who who said to me, you know, you make a lot of mistakes. There's been a huge, an ongoing critique of um, American relational psychoanalytic theory. And the critique is, gen like I've heard Juliet Mitchell, I've been in things with her where she'll, she'll say, you know, really, you're talking about the pre-conscious and not the unconscious. Um, and, what does that uh, mean? Okay, so what it means is you're not really getting to depth. What you're talking about is surface, things that can very easily become conscious. Mm -hmm. That is not my experience in, the, in the, the work that I do. And I think in part, you know, in, in terms of like just really speaking about um, her work, which I think is amazing, um, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about ideas of the unconscious having particular contents. And, you know, if, if, it's, if it's not like, I think for her, it's like gender, generation, and the sibling thing that she added to those contents. Um, uh, then it's not unconscious, you know. It's 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 just it's it's surface. And um, I uh, do not believe that things like um, gender, uh, whiteness. I, I believe that our subject subject formation involves 
processes of splitting to become what we are wanted, what we're wanted to become. Um, we split, we split off things that, as I was saying earlier, make us unlovable. And I, I think in, in attaining a, I, you know, in attaining a white identity involves repudiating certain ways of being and thinking and feeling, um, that, uh, then get projected and for me that's that's depth so um, for sure yeah that's one of the things that always baffles me about the field i mean when i went to get my i have a side and when i went to get my side it had been like you're saying like the psychology had completely sold out by this point i started in 2002 and graduated in 2007 so it was like it was just all like here are the medications here's the dsm Here's some yeah. humanistic training, you know, here's some oh, yeah. behavioral psychology and then CBT, DBT, you know, it was like, and I didn't know that the, that, that had happened because, you know, I was, I don't know, 24 or whatever. And so I was like, well, where's Freud? You know? And fortunately, there was a couple analysts from New York that had like retired in Florida and like taught a class at my school. So thank God for them because I just like latched so onto them awesome. and was like, please help me, you know. And one uh, one of them was like really he was drive theory. He was like really Freudian, like early Freud. And then the other one was very object relations. Um, so it was a nice balance, and I got I learned a lot from them both. And thank goodness they were there because otherwise I don't know yeah. what I would have done. But I was so surprised because I had always thought that like like we when I did get a psychology also uh, undergraduate degree. And, you know, we learned about Skinner and Pavlov and all these things. But I thought that these were, like, different layers of, like, ways of being in the human. And that, like, you know, sometimes maybe relaxation training and breathing exercises is helpful. And sometimes you need to talk about your mother. You know, like, like <laughs> these are all useful tools and, like, different ways of looking at people, you know. I didn't know that everyone was, like, wedded to, like, one or the other. And right. I just find it so strange, even in like, even when you do find your way into psychoanalysis proper, then it's right. still like, there's just like infinite divides. And, and I feel uh, like everyone spends more time arguing about all the divides and like what makes their kind of psychoanalysis different rather yeah. than like, like, it's great that people argue and like have debates and stuff. But at the end of the day, like we're all doing talk therapy and like we all like we're all on the same team. You know, what I mean? like yes, yes. that's that's very interesting that you point that out because it's it's so, um, you know, it's so redolent in every field. There's there. I, I guess that's partly like protecting your turf. I, I don't know. But it's it is fruitless. I, I've learned a lot. I mean, I, I've learned a lot from Lacanian theorists a lot. Um, and I use, you know, the way I see things is you use what feels like it works for you. Right. So I try, as I said, I use some Kleinian theory. I'm a theory junkie. Me too. Yeah, I'm very eclectic. <laughs> I, pay, I pick what I like out of everybody. Exactly. Um, but you're picking it because it feels true to you in some way mm-hmm. um, and not because you want to be the star of the relational school or the star of the Lacanian school. Right. Um, yeah, that's 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 the way I I have always gone about my work. I'm, I'm not interested in religious, you know, institutions. So. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to memorize dogma. I just want to like work with my analysis and yeah, be, be an activist. Great. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Lynn Layton. For links to her new book, Toward a Social Psychoanalysis, Culture, Character, and Normative Unconscious Processes, as well as her other books, please visit the text accompanying this episode. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Trapart Books, 2019. Please visit our publisher's website, 
www.trapart.net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l your support is greatly appreciated for more information you can visit my website drvanessasinclair.net or the podcast website renderingunconscious.org Sexuality. Third. 